Hey, how's it going? I'm Ella Feingold. I am an orchestrator. I hope you're doing really well. I never really know where to look in the camera on this thing, so sorry. Um, today I want to talk about DAW orchestration problems. Um, just the different types of things as orchestrators that we receive and how things that work in the DAW don't necessarily work with a player and for the orchestra. Um, I'm not going to be giving any solutions today. This is just an introduction to a lot of the issues that we face. And then I'll make subsequent videos talking about each one of these things and, you know, the multiple ways that we can solve these things. Um, this is by no means a video to, you know, bash composers or say that they're writing incorrectly. There are just things that work really well with sample libraries and composing in a DAW that composers have to do that don't work with the orchestra. So I don't want anyone to think I'm bashing composers because I'm definitely not. Composers in, in film and video games have just punishing um, deadlines to meet, as do orchestrators. You know, it's a whole sort of conveyor belt. And if they're rushed, we're rushed. And so anyways, I just want to talk about the different issues that come up. If you have any topics you'd like me to discuss that you think I um, missed, please write in the comments below. Um, I'd love, excuse me, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So this might be painfully obvious, but you know, Composer in today's age is typically writing in a DAW, a digital audio workstation like Logic, Cubase, Digital Performer. They're using sample libraries. They have crazy deadlines to meet where they have to write tons of music quickly and effectively. They're likely using pre-made templates where they might have, you know, all of their favorite synths and um, orchestral sample libraries. And these things are all routed out um, to stems and whatnot. Um, maybe Cubase is routed to Pro Tools or whatnot. So typically it's sort of a well-oiled um, machine. And I think the most important thing to really sit with is that composers are um, writing on a keyboard. They're calling up an oboe patch, uh, a string ensemble patch, whatever, a harp, um, and they're playing it on a keyboard and they're playing it with 10 fingers. Um, and I think that that's important because there are things that we do on a piano that we wouldn't do um, with the instruments of the orchestra. So being mindful of those things. One example, like maybe a composer's not being mindful and they're playing with 10 fingers, but harpists only use four fingers on each hand. So you may encounter things that are just impossible to play and so you're having to cross hands. So I'm just bringing that up to say that it's almost like you have to look at orchestration today as piano transcription almost, because even though they may be playing a brass patch, it's being played on a keyboard and being played pianistically. So something to be mindful of. So a lot of these issues, which I'd like to go through right now, um, you know, these are sort of, these are the most important things. These are the things you have to get right and you have to address because um, as one of my mentors says, you know, never turn a compositional problem into a performance problem. And a lot of these things may be seen as um, like plumbing or electrical or fixing the foundation rather than wanting to be a painter and applying beautiful brush strokes of color with the orchestra. But these are the things that will, you know, um, ruin a performance or not balance well if we don't take care of a lot of these issues. So these are in no particular order, but I'd just like to talk about some of the things I see a lot. Um, and again, we'll talk about these things in detail in future videos. So breathing problems. Um, maybe the composer is just holding down middle C on a horn patch and the sample loops and it's just going forever in the winds or the brass. So we have, you know, um, to solve that problem because people need to breathe. Um, so, uh, and the solutions are different within each choir. Um, what to leave in MIDI? 
Um, sometimes we get stuff where we've got aleatory in the strings and a string melody and a string ostinato and we have all these ideas. And sometimes, depending on budget and recording schedule, we have to leave certain things in MIDI um, and we need to talk to the composer and say, hey, I think we should leave this in, in MIDI. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think this extended technique is going to record well or be a good, you know, use of our recording time. So we'll talk about that in a future video. Leaps in the writing. Um, and then I wrote, can be troublesome for strings with string crossing. So this is just talking about um, just lots of leaps from a tenth or whatever and certain things it's a little more idiomatic like if you saw my video on the bassoon the other day you know a lot of these leaps are no problem it's sort of bread and butter on the instrument but maybe you're a string player and you're you know having to cross from your G to your um, your A string or something and it might be an awkward leap so how do we solve those things um, what do we do? Um, voice count in inconsistency problems where, you know, a composer is just playing ensemble patches and they might go from a three note chord and an ostinato motor to all of a sudden five and then back to three and then it goes into unison and just talking about all the different ways of how we handle those problems, you know, with the VC and the strings or with woodwinds and brass, are we bringing in extra players just for those notes that happen? Or are we counting up all the notes and going, all right, we've got a maximum of five notes, so we're going to have five people playing the whole time. Um, sometimes that works depending on the dynamic, and sometimes that just turns everything gray. Um, so some more issues, too many notes and not enough players. This is more common. <laughs> Um, also sort of it gets into like having too many ideas. Um, so, you know, you as an orchestrator have to figure out, um, what notes to leave out. Are some notes just, uh, doubling an octave that can be left out that are maybe in synths or maybe they're in another choir that don't need to be there. So that's something that we are faced with. Um, this is a very interesting one, this next one, and a lot of people probably can't imagine that this is real, but this is something I encounter a lot, which is too many players and not enough notes, where you might have like a 14-piece woodwind section and there's one idea, and, you know, it's fortissimo or something, and how do you, you know, solve that? And so having the whole herd on it, you know, can sound gray because you've got all kinds of unison doubling. And so we have to find solutions to deal with that. Um, you know, does this involve complex dovetailing? Does this involve leaving out, say, the double reeds or leaving out certain colors within a choir? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to deal with this issue. Um, when it's quiet, there's a solution um, that's very effective. And when it's loud, there's another solution. Um, so, um, yeah, I wrote too many ideas in one choir. Um, certain choirs lend themselves better to having a lot of ideas. Like for me, I tend to think of the woodwinds uh, as a choir that can just help everyone out. You know, we can have some high people up with the strings and some low people pecking and maybe a couple of bassoons helping with horns or feeling in harmony. And I sort of look to my woodwinds as, as helpers a lot of times. But I see in strings a lot where there's a melody, there's an ostinato in the middle, there's held harmony, and there's just too many ideas. And there are a lot of different ways to solve that problem. Um, solve those problems with overdubs and um, a lot of different things. Um, sustain pedal on. So believe it or not, sometimes it's a mistake and a composer has the sustain pedal down and they don't know it. But more than uh, more often, what it just means is that they may be pay playing a um, sustain patch in brass winds or strings and the pedal's down. And so you have to recreate that um, in the orchestra. And again, different choirs will lend themselves to different 
or ways of orchestrating that. In other words, um, if notes are starting to pile up with the sustain pedal on, is everybody coming on each note and going to another note? Or, you know, are we keeping people out and adding people as each note gets added on? So I'll talk about ways to solve that problem. Um, lack of articulations. Um, this happens a lot, believe it or not, where um, a composer might be using, like, say, a sustain patch in a French horn. Okay. Well, you could typically assume that a sustain patch could be just they want legato and things are going to be slurred. But sometimes I've had composers use a sustain patch, um, meaning that the notes aren't connected. Legato, there, there are no legato transitions. And so everything sort of sounds tenuto, sometimes depending on how the library was sampled. And sometimes the character might be militaristic and um, tenuto might be the right call rather than legato. And so, you know, a lot of times I hear composers say, oh, it's in the MIDI, just listen to the mock-up. And I would say that sometimes it is, but think about a phrase of music and say, confined to the French horn. I mean, think about the phrasing that goes into it. Maybe you're slurring the first two notes and then there's a tenuto note with a lot of emphasis. And then you're slurring two notes and you're getting off of the note with a sort of um, staccato breath where there's a little bit of attack. And, you know, just like I'm speaking right now and there's articulation and sometimes I'm talking and it's like cursive and the words are connected and sometimes they're not and I'm emphasizing. and. That is, you know, the language of music. But what that means in a DAW is that the composer has to call six different patches and, you know, program it. And, you know, a lot of composers don't do that and they use one patch. And so as orchestrators, we have to listen to the full mix and interpret the, the energy and the emotion of the music and decide, is this tenuto? Is this legato tongue, you know. Um, so that's something that, you know, I get confronted with a lot that can slow my process down where I, I do really need to think of articulation because they're not using a marcato patch, a legato patch, you know. I'm typically getting short and long. And as you know, short can be, you know, a sort of secco sound. It can be staccatissimo with a lot of attack. It can be mezzo staccato. Um, so there's a lot of decisions, you know, that need to get made with that. Um, lack of CC data. So a very, you know, competent composer um, or ones that I work for that are really know what they're doing is when you look at their MIDI that they've sent, there's lots of CC data, meaning modulation, expression, volume, because they're shaping the music, they're shaping the phrases. And we study that CC data and then reflect that in the page, in the orchestration with hairpins and whatnot. And so sometimes we get music and there's no CC data whatsoever. And so we as orchestrators, um, at least I personally, try and interpret it and put that in. Otherwise the music is just sort of lifeless. Um, so that's another thing to discuss. Um, uh, one thing I see a lot is like, you know, one choir, maybe the winds and the brass are doing the same thing. But for some reason, the brass has mod wheel data and the winds have none. And so you have to decide, you know, how to handle that. So that's another issue or a common one in the strings will be like, the whole string choirs say legato melody, but only the cello has the modulation. Um, did they forget? Do they want the cello to be brought out and to be more expressive? So those are, again, other things that we have to um, grapple with. Um, deciding on durations from MIDI is another thing that happens a lot, you know. Um, is this a whole note or is it a dotted half note tied to an eighth? Um, where there's a little bit of a breath at the end of every bar because you just want just a little bit of separation. And if that's a tutti moment in the orchestra, would you have that in every choir? Maybe you want it to be a whole note in the strings and in the woodwinds to have the breath. Maybe because they need to breathe 
maybe because you just want to hear a little touch of color in the strings to linger a little bit longer, but those are decisions you need to make. Um, you know, is the is it a quarter note with a staccato dot, um, or is it just an eighth note or an eighth with a staccato dot? So there's a lot of things that um, a lot of decisions that need to be made with duration. Um, just because it might look like a whole note in MIDI doesn't mean that that's what you would necessarily do. You know, maybe in the brass they need to breathe. So are you going to put in breath commas? Are you going to write in the rest with the rests? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's another issue. Um, one of my <laughs> one of my favorites or not so favorite is the 2D ensemble patch with the winds where everything just sounds like a pipe organ. And basically what it is, is, you know, um, Spitfire Albion one is like one of the leading culprits where you push down a note and basically they've piled everyone onto that note who can possibly play that um, note. And so what you get is constantly a mix of everyone on the note. And as you start to play harmony, um, things just sound gray and colorless. Um, and so you have to think as an orchestrator, what, what does the composer want? Do they, do they want a big gray pipe organ mass? Are they looking for me to, you know, sort of prune this down like a, you know, like a bonsai tree and, and like a Japanese gardener? And am I kind of separating colors out? Um, you know, so that's another thing that happens a lot. We get it with string ensemble patches, brass ensemble patches. Um, so the next thing is general dynamics. Um, a lot a lot of times, you know, everything can sound mezzo forte, and that's one issue, and dynamics sort of lie. Like, the music may appear to be pianissimo, and you're hearing a horn patch, and it's like molto quivre. Well, you're not getting molto quivre at pianissimo. So you have to decide, you know, does the composer mean a sort of echo horn hand-stopped? Um, you know, how, how do I reflect that color? Um, so there's a lot of things with dynamics where something might sound mezzo forte or forte, but it's in a pianissimo texture and vice versa. I've gotten stuff where it's like apparently like um, fortissimo, but you hear like an alto flute on middle C and it's like breathy. And, and so you have so many decisions to make on conflicting sort of dynamics. Um, and another common problem is getting something that might be like, you know, a six minute piece of music and everything is at fortissimo and everyone's blowing their brains out. And what does that mean? You know, are you going to have five or six minutes of 2D where the ear is going to fatigue of the woodwinds and the brass and, you know, their chops, you know, like um, my friend Brett was saying the other day, string players, you know, you're using big muscles and so they can play longer, but brass players and winds, you know, you're using a muscle here that fatigues easily. So, you know, there's ways of how do we solve that problem? Um, and is that actually what the composer wants? I mean, should this slowly build from a, you know, a mild mezzo forte up to a fortissimo? So that's another issue that we face. Um, Another one I get a lot is low brass pedals, and they don't speak down there. And a lot of composers don't realize that. A lot of composers kind of think that the lower the note is, the more power is there. And maybe in certain instruments, um, but using some of these pedals, pedal notes sometimes in the trombones and whatnot, it takes a while to speak down there. And it sound it can just sound like, you know, like an idle engine or something. They don't they don't speak and a lot of times you get more power when it's up the octave. Um, a lot of these sample libraries, what they'll do is they'll sample a particular note and you know where it's low enough and where it, it really barks and then they'll just you know sh pitch it, stretch it down you know eight semitones and so as Conrad Pope says you know MIDI is can be Satan or MIDI is Satan and so composers begin to believe that those notes, you know, articulate like that and speak like that in that range where it doesn't, you know, it absolutely doesn't. And 
Um, this is probably one of the most common things, you know. I mean, that's what God made the contrabassoon for, some of these notes. Um, yeah, I mean, some of these notes on the tuba and pedals with the trombone, like they just, there's no power. There's no urgency. Um, and a lot of that stuff's better off just in synths and whatnot. But I'll talk about ways to, um, how you handle those things. Uh, another thing sometimes can be low muddy thirds in the bass clef that might sound good on a particular patch that they're using. Um, and you have to determine, you know, do I need to revoice this and invert it? Or is this a really, you know, jarring tense moment and I really do need to make it ugly? Um, something I didn't write but I do want to talk about is Sometimes with music that's right on the border of, you know, where it's clusters and you have to decide, am I going to get all of these pitches that the composer wrote and give them exactly what they wrote where, it, you know, or does it not, does the pitch not really matter and they just need something really chaotic? And am I going to note, notate that in an aleatoric fashion or am I going to be incredibly literal and write out all 12 pitches or whatnot? So that's another thing orchestrators face. Um... Another category is ethnic instruments, you know, duduk, um, shakuhachi, ocarina, um, a lot of esoteric ethnic instruments um, happens a lot in film and video game music. And you have to, you know, figure out, are these going to be covered by players live with the orchestra? And if they are, well, are they going to get obliterated? Like recorders are going to get obliterated by the orchestra. So do we need to strike them? Is this particular instrument that they called for, even though it's in a sample library and they're playing whatever notes they want, is it a chromatic instrument or is it just available, you know, in one key? Um, you know, so you have to decide, are we keeping this in MIDI? Are we striping this? You know, so that's another um, issue that we face. So that's sort of the end of the video. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not trying to bash composers because I've mocked up stuff. And as an orchestrator, there's things that I know work in the orchestra. But when you do it with um, sample libraries, it doesn't necessarily sound great. Sometimes you just need mass where it's, yeah, the ensemble patch. And then you copy it onto another ensemble patch. And then you split it out and you're layering choirs um, and samples because you just need power or mass and sometimes the subtlety and the refinements that work in the orchestra don't in the DAW um, because they're not you know um, playing in the same room with the overtones and everyone bleeding and so that's a whole nother thing going from the orchestra to mocking up a DAW um, mocking up in the DAW excuse me so um, yeah I think that you know we covered a lot in a short ish period of time and so yeah if there's anything you think i'm missing i'd really love to hear from you um and stay tuned for a lot of videos with examples of how to solve some of these things so thanks again for tuning in stay weird be kind don't forget to love yourself and each other and i'll catch you on the next one okay